All right. You're all set. Okay. Well, I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting to order on September 1, 2020. It is now 2.35 p.m. And uh, this meeting is being held uh, as a virtual meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 38, Section 18. This meeting of the uh, Finance Committee is being conducted via remote participation. And uh, so I would uh, need to first uh, go through the um, participants in the meeting. Um, just need to close out what I... Do you have anything on the screen, Lynn? You have to tell me, did it come up as the agenda? Uh, no, what it came up is I'm just seeing the... Uh, uh, seeing the directory. You're, yep, you're, yeah. uh, uh, let me take it down for the moment and figure yeah, it out. Yeah, I want to do that because I actually want to uh, welcome, start by uh, doing two things at the same time. I need to go through each member of the committee to ask them to confirm that they can hear me and be heard. But I want to also take the opportunity to welcome for the first time to the Council Finance Committee, uh, somebody who's familiar to many of us um, because he's done so much for the Council and for the town and is now um, on the Finance Committee as a resident member and a former member of the uh, old Finance Committee, Bernie Kubiak. Bernie, welcome to the committee. Well, thank you. I'm happy to have a chance to do this again. One thing I'm going to, I have behind me a large monitor to display all of the documents so I can see them. But if I, if I appear to be like looking off into space, it's because I'm looking at that large monitor. Um, okay. we, we won't call any for EMTs or anything yeah, like, no, no, no. like you're fading out. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, now we know we can hear you and you could hear us. So I'm going to go through and, uh, introduce other members of the committee if you don't know them already and I'll uh, start with uh, actually our other resident member is President Bob Hegner. Yes, hi, I can hear you. Welcome Bernie. Thank you. Okay and then uh, we'll go through the uh, members of the committee who are counselors. Uh, in addition to myself of course, uh, Lynn Griesmer. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Beth Angelis. Here. Dorothy Pam. Here. So um, all members of the committee are present can hear and be heard. So um, at this point, um, I guess it would be helpful for a moment, at least to put up the agenda. I can do it too, if you're unable to, but. Um, Better be able to, but yeah. In any event, I wanted what I wanted to do was quickly preview the agenda as to how we're going to go through it, and then um, take um, the uh, agenda. Here we go. Um, by the way, uh, once again, that uh, accidentally on top shows good community resources committee, which I think is a cut and paste thing that's been happening. But in any event. This is the Finance Committee, just so everybody is sure. Uh, I'm referring to that section and referring to Governor Baker's order. So what we were going to do is just get a preliminary uh, report on where we are with FY20, FY21 from Sonia and Sean. Um, I think that there, we're not going to spend much time on it because uh, we will be getting a um, year-end and quarter budget report for FY20. And I think that at that point, we'll have a more complete discussion. And Sean had already sent us um, to the council, which has been forwarded to all members of the committee, um, a report on FY21 so that uh, we know where we are against our budget projections from the report that he had given to us. Um, we will then uh, want to turn into turn very quickly to the capital inventory 
uh, discussion, which is a matter that was referred to us last night by the council and um, is uh, a matter that um, was uh, requested by the town manager um, in pursuant to provisions in the charter itself. So that'll be the, uh, the second part of the discussion and we're gonna, uh, I think be joined by counselor, uh, one additional counselor, Darcy Dumont, who's a member of the um, ECAC, the Energy uh, uh, Com Committee. And she's going to talk about their goals and plans and uh, it is going to have budget implications and she may talk about that some today. This is uh, intended as an introduction to um, get us um, so that we're aware of what is happening. Uh, from there, we'll talk a little bit about um, the process we've just gone through and the process ahead um, and wanna start setting the goals for the uh, committee over the next months and start working towards a meeting schedule. And one of the um, topics that will come up in that is the agenda item number five, water and sewer rates, um, and uh, what we might be interested in looking at. And I noticed that Guilford is um, present um, at the meeting, and I appreciate that. Uh, and Guilford, if uh, you wanted to uh, take a break and come back in half an hour, 45 minutes, I don't think you'll miss your item. So I just wanted to let you know that. Kathy? Um, Sharon emailed that she can't find the Zoom link. So if Athena could send it to her again, I don't think I can just share mine. I think it's individualized. And Darcy emailed that she's in the in attendee world because she didn't get an invitation as panelist. So when we get to her, someone will have to bring her in. I'll, I'll bring her in when we get to ECAC. Okay. And, and I'll send a link to Sharon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, are there any questions about the agenda or any, cha any requests to change the order on the agenda? Lynn has her hand up, Andy. Yes, Lynn. And she, Lynn, you're muted. <laughs> Lynn, were you asking for recognition because you still can't hear you? Okay. Um, so let me uh, just go on from there. And uh, why don't we take down the agenda then for the moment and so we can all see each other better. So um, Lynn, if you wanna um, stop the sharing for a moment and uh, I'll turn it over to Sean and uh, Sonia to See if you have anything that you want to just briefly report about FY20 and FY21, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned earlier, Andy, there'll be a full report in the very near future. Um, but Sonia is gonna hit some of the highlights of FY20. Um, and I might add a few things and on uh, FY20 and FY21. But Sonia, do you wanna start with um, the highlights? Or can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so, our estimates that we did earlier in the year are, are pretty much on. We're looking at a revenue deficit in the general fund of under 500,000. And um, we're having returned appropriations of about $2.4 million. And that's due to a lot of the regular operations that we do. We, we, we couldn't go forward with um, this year with um, COVID happening. And we also, Put a lot of expenses, all expenses that we could, we put onto COVID for the CARES account. So that helped us return quite a bit of money on the appropriation side. So um, for this year's budget, we're probably going to be returning about 1.7 million in total towards free cash. 
Um, that doesn't mean you just add it to the free cash number from last year and that's what it is. It's a large calculation and we also had quite a bit of money that was transferred, some into OPEB and some into the um, stabilization fund. So the free cash number will be different. On the enterprise funds, um, those were pretty grim this year, but that's no surprise either. Um, we're looking at probably a $650,000 uh, deficit in the sewer department. They're probably about 450 in the water department. Transportation is going to look like it came out even. However, what we did, we were like $250,000 um, deficit there, but they didn't have a fund balance that could um, that could net that out against. So what we did is we reduced some of the indirect costs that went into the general fund. So basically the general fund um, took that loss. And uh, the landfill actually made $6,000, so. Sonia, are all the ones you're doing end of the year, at June, June 2020? Yes, yeah. the result of the fiscal year 2020. But those numbers, they're not quite set in stone yet. We're still balancing out stuff out, so things could change, but I don't see them changing drastically from there. Did I miss anything, Sean? So no, I think that's, if there's any questions on FY20, we'll take those um, before we move to FY21, if that's okay. Okay, Kathy, did you have anything else? Here's your hand is up. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I didn't want to just shout out. I'll try to behave. Um, so my, my question is with, with the end of the year and the cash balances, and this will come up next week with JCPC, one of the things we discussed is if the end of the year turned out to be more robust than we thought, some might be appropriated for capital. So the, my question is, if that's a possibility, when would we be in a position to make that decision, just timing-wise? I guess I don't understand what your question is about some of, of fiscal year 20's money being available for capital. Or spending that we had more at the end of the year, so we created this capital reserve. Yes, if, that has, that's fiscal year 21. It has nothing to do with, with how 20 ends. That money, that reserve money for capital in fiscal year 21 is there, the 700. Um, right. So well, I'll try to rephrase it. So if we ended the year with a plus 1.7 that will be in free cash, if we wanted to, meaning the whole town, appropriate some of that out of free cash to FY21 capital, what would be the steps that would be need to be done and when could that kind of decision be made? I will, first you would have to exhaust the 700,000 reserve that you have on capital and it's just a matter of bringing it to the town council to vote and finance committee, so. Yeah, and Kathy, we'll update you at JCPC um, on it, you know the status of any requests that we've gotten so far uh, for that capital reserve. Um, but at this point, we haven't exhausted those funds, so we wouldn't anticipate needing to use any of the any free cash at this point. Um, but Sonia, you'll probably note this. Um, you know, this past year, the council did approve a using free cash or maybe a stabilization for some capital projects, and so that will net out against any money we return. Um, what was it, three or four hundred thousand? Sonia was approved. Yeah, it was, um, the Hickory Ridge, three hundred eight. Yeah. So. Let's pause for just a up. moment. Um, Sharon, uh, just want to make sure that you can join, that you can hear us and we can hear you. I can hear you. And uh, sorry, for, the, sorry for being late. Welcome to the committee and uh, you uh, missed an introduction of somebody who you worked with on the old finance committee, Bernie, who's now joined this finance committee. And um, we're starting with a review of the FY20, and that's basically where you came in, is to sort of the pre preliminary report. Um, so let me go back to Kathy, and did, um, 
That no, that that answered my question. I think Bernie had either a follow up or a different question. Yeah. Just a point of information for me. Um, does our city status still mean that we have to wait for the Department of Revenue to certify free cash? Yes. Yeah. So that wouldn't that certification probably wouldn't happen until September October, right? Given uh, end of October probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's what it would take for that to become available for appropriation. Right. I believe they extended our, our current certification for a while, but I'm not sure when that deadline ends. Do you know, Sean? No, I can't see you. <laughs> um, uh, no. You well, both of those answer my question. It's, a, it's, it's an exhausting the reserve, and then at some point at the end of 2020, if we've exhausted it, would be when we could, if we wanted to look at that. I mean, there may be other needs that come up. I'm just using that as an example. Okay. Dorothy, your, your hand is up, I see. Uh, Sonia, um, when you said that you returned 1.7 million towards free cash, and then you said transferred some money to OPEB, was that the money you had planned to return to OPEB or was that additional money to OPEB? So, um, before we were fully in, before we were fully insured, we were part of the Medicare D program, which um, which we were getting reimbursements from, and that would that would automatically fall to to free cash. It was general fund revenue, so we would let it revert to um, free cash. And then once once we had a chance, we used to do it in the fall town meetings. Actually, we would always vote mm -hmm. an appropriation from free cash into OPEB just to transfer it over. Okay. So it wasn't spent, it's just sitting there in another reserve. Right. So it was the amount, you, it was what you expected is all I'm asking. Right, it was like okay. 382,000 that we transferred and then we transferred 2.5 to stabilization because per our financial policies, we move anything over 5% of the operating budget into stabilization fund. And this year it was 2.5 because the health claims trust fund paid us back the 2 million. So that's why it was so high. So what are, what, where are we with stabilization fund then? What does that bring us up to? Uh, give me a minute and I'll let you know. So what we're going to be having to confront as a finance committee and um, council will have to be considering is what we need in the way of money for the five major capital projects and um, what should come from there. Other capital that has been pushed back because we initially started a process um, for FY21 that um, severely diminished the amount of capital um, from what was originally planned. And uh, so the lot of capital has been put off, which was what the JCPC question is. And then our uncertainties about FY21, uh, our FY22 rather, as we start building the budget. So we have multiple pieces. Uh, Sonia, do you have an answer to that question? Um, just short of 12 million, $11,996,175 is what's sitting in our stabilization fund. And that's with the 2.5? Yes. Okay. Okay. Anything so else? Because otherwise... Uh, that just moved from free cash to stabilization. So total reserves didn't change. Yep. So Sean, do you have anything uh, you want to just add about the year that just started? Yeah, I mean, uh, quickly, I'll just add that, um, you know, we did, I sent out the memo on state aid. So if there's any follow up questions, but we were looking positive on the state aid front currently. Um, part of that memo was information on what Washington is doing and uh, with respect to the, the uh, federal stimulus of some sort. Um, our current funds that we have from the government, the CARES Act, uh, those can be used through the end of December. And after that, we don't really have anything at that point. Um, so there's two bills that Washington is discussing. It doesn't seem like they made a ton of progress, and I believe they're adjourned right now until September 8th or so. Um, but we're, you know, we're hoping that there's some sort of bill that comes out of Washington in the near future that either extends the CARES Act beyond December or gives us new money. Um, 
preferably for revenue losses, because that's really where we took a big hit was on the revenue side. Um, also on the CARES front, we've been shifting staff around as best we can to, to utilize them um, to help with COVID related things like managing um, Puffer's Pond and uh, you know we, we moved some parking enforcement officers around. Um, some staff in our office helped support some of that stuff, trails, um, doing social distancing uh, communications at trails and things of that nature. So we are trying to be flexible and, and utilize staff the, the best way we can so we don't have to incur additional costs. Um, and also those things can be covered by CARES because they're specifically related to COVID. Um, and as Sonia mentioned for FY20, for FY21, we're doing the same thing in terms of everything we can buy from CARES, we are. Um, all the PP&E that has been purchased for the town and for the schools, that's all come out of CARES money. Um, there have been some small capital improvements that have been needed that have also come out of CARES. Um, the, the one, you know, there's several criteria, but one of the big ones that we just have to be mindful of is anything from CARES has to be before December 30th. Um, again, after that point, it's no longer eligible to be used from CARES. And I think the, the big thing I'll point out in terms of the budget itself, uh, we're really trying to keep close tabs on local receipts. That's the area where we're, um, you know, we, we have the maybe the most volatility for the FY21 budget and going forward. Uh, and I include in that sort of the enterprise funds and water consumption, sewer consumption with UMass, you know, their operation significantly lower this summer. And also then obviously the fall, then not coming back fully. Um, we're still seeing reduced water consumption, sewer consumption. And as many of you know, that's, you know, those are what drive the revenues for the enterprise funds. So that's an area we're monitoring closely and um, working with Guilford on to, to keep, you know, be up to as up to date as possible if there's anything that we have to do there. And that's, that's sort of it for FY21, if there's any questions. Hey, three hands up, I'm gonna recognize uh, in order, Dorothy Pam. Um, this is a simple one. I know that uh, the town manager said that um, if needed, staff would be used to um, fill out the workers for the polling stations. And uh, my husband, Bob, made a little tour today and found, um, went to everything except the North and the South, um, everything in order, very few voters at that time, but um, you know, all totally under control. Uh, which is good because it, it gives them a chance to see if there's anything they want to change for um, November. Uh, but my question is, do you happen to know how many staff were in fact used in this enterprise today and tonight? Um, several is my understanding. I don't have the exact number, but we can um, talk to Paul and, and find out how many. Um, but I know there are quite a few that staff from, I think, LSC and the Senior Center. Um, mm -hmm other areas facilities that have really helped with the election initiative so um, but we can get that information for you okay yeah i gather that uh it was also pretty intensive as far as just getting the mailed ballots out and um, i don't know if they need ended up having to use extra help to the clerk's office yeah there was a lot of um, a lot of you know. There's people who are helping today on election day, but there's been a lot of in addition. There's been a lot of people who have been helping um, stuff stuff the ballots and the and the envelopes to get them out to people, and um, a lot of that sort of prep work to to make it work well. Um, so that's happened over the last week or two. There's been a lot of a lot of extra hands on deck here in, in town hall. Um, so it's been a, a nice team effort. Has it required any additional expenditure by paying overtime or anything like that? Um, I don't know about overtime. Um, again, we've been able to shift people around pretty well. People have been able to be flexible and, and do work during their day. Um, I know there have been people here on weekends. Um, I'm not sure if they were salaried or hourly employees, but we, again, we can look into that and find out how much. Because I went to early voting on a Sunday at Bangs and it was staff there. Yeah. Yeah. But can, can those expenses be, be covered with some of the CARES money? I mean, besides the PPE? Yeah, I mean, I've got a, that's a good question. It's been asked a couple of times. Um, one of the criteria is it has to be something that's sort of unbudgeted. Um, so I've got to go back and do a little more digging about whether we already had budgets for that um, and, and whether it's sort of specifically driven by COVID. So it's, it's Maybe, and we're gonna, you know, sometimes there's things that are in that gray area. We just have to ask the state whether or not they'll, they'll make it eligible. Yeah, so it, it, at least from observation, again, just on early voting, 
Um, they had masks available. If someone forgot the mask, they had plastic screens up. So aside from these were staff we would have paid anywhere, there was apparatus there yeah. that was different than would have what would have been normally there. They they gave you your own um, plastic tape to seal the envelope because they didn't want you to lick it um, and they didn't want to touch it. <laughs> so it was, uh, <laughs> here's a dispensary. No, it was very thoughtful on, you know, how to keep it hands-free, um, but that was not the typical way <laughs> you got your ballot, yeah. Lynn. You have your hand up. Yeah, so I actually want to stay on the CARES Act for a moment. I actually drove around and observed a couple polls and there was absolutely no activity going on. Uh, so I think our early voting efforts really have paid off. Um, so uh, going to the CARES Act, um, I mean, I'm assuming that this is treated like a very large grant. And my understanding is that our grant is somewhere around 3 million, is that correct? Yeah, so so we got three and a half million for mm -hmm. CARES approximately. Um, the the piece about CARES that makes it hard to tell you exactly where we're at is that for anything that is FEMA eligible, uh, CARES is only covering twenty five percent, and FEMA is covering seventy five percent. And yep. the FEMA um, the process to get reimbursed by FEMA is much more robust and intense. Um, and so there's some items right now that are sort of in between where we're going to submit for FEMA, and if they're reimbursed by FEMA, then we'll get, you know, that's great, we'll get the money from FEMA and 25% from CARES. Um, if they're not approved by FEMA, then all of it would come from CARES. So, so that's sort of where we're at. We've spent a good amount on PP&E and cleaning supplies, and we've gotten reimbursed already from CARES for that, and we're waiting reimbursement on the FEMA front um, for those. I was items. just gonna say, is there a deadline for FEMA so, so there's not a deadline um, anytime soon in terms of submitting the request. FEMA does have an earlier deadline in terms of its eligibility period. Yeah. Um, I believe it's the end of this month is actually the, the incident period for FEMA unless they, you know, they were talking about potentially pushing it back. Um, but last time we spoke with our representative from FEMA or our liaison, um, we could only submit for cost to FEMA through the end of this month. So we are, we're going to do a couple requests to FEMA because it is such a robust process and it takes a while to get reimbursed that we, we wanted to get an application in. So um, we're about to push go on the application for all of our costs up through June 30th. And then we'll have to submit another request for things between July 1st and um, the end of the incident period, which would be at the end of this month right now. So, um, I mean, normally I don't think we take on the responsibility of monitoring grants. But, uh, and I think that that's wise that we don't, um, but it, it, I, we have had questions asked by residents regarding what kind of expenses mm -hmm. the um, uh, CARES money can cover. Um, we recently had a question about the ambassadors and can they cover the ambassador program? Um, and then uh, they've gotten into issues of recruitment and uh, social justice, but uh, more importantly, I think what people are most curious about is, are we able to spend the CARES money down? Are we, um, and what is it actually able to cover? So right. at some point without us saying, you know, could you please show us the books on the CARES Act? I think it would be useful for us to, as a council and as a finance committee to have some sense of what CARES Act money paid for. Yeah, and I can send you, um, the, the state put out a municipal, sort of like their guidelines of potential municipal uses, so I can send you that. Um, I can tell you for us, the majority of it's been spent on uh, PP&E, cleaning supplies, um, making modifications to buildings for social distancing purposes, um, additional EMT support, um, you know, potentially ramping up if there's gonna be additional needs there. Um, it helped with some of the, um, some of the rental assistance related to COVID, that was a, an expense that was approved by the state um, if there was a COVID specific, you know, rental assistance need. So there's been a, quite a few things and yeah, we, there's a, we can provide a summary at some point of sort of the general categories or, you know, whatever you guys need for that. Um, in terms of spending it down, the, the last report I saw from the state is, you know, communities, they, they gave a lot of money to communities. And I think 
at the time, they were thinking that eventually the state or the, the federal government was going to allow those funds to be used for revenue replacement uh, as an eligible right. funds, which they haven't yet. So right now it can only be used for expenditures. Um, so the last report I saw from the state was that, you know, most communities, if not all of them, have only spent, you know, maybe 25 to 50 percent of their CARES Act funds so far. Um, and I think that was intentional, but there, so there is quite a bit of money still across the state in terms of CARES Act funds that remains to be spent. So you're saying that the question that's out there is, for example, could we use it to cover up the revenue loss on our various enterprise funds? And yeah, and, and the answer is we can't currently. Um, right. That's, that's one of the things that, depending on what bill is approved in Washington, um, it might be, right. that might change, but currently we, we can't. Right. So in the CARES money is administered through the state, but it's federal money. It's federal, yeah. It's administered yeah. through the state, yeah. Okay. Just stay, have we tested, or do you already know, um, if we're doing a virtual learning for our school systems and have expenses for computers, wireless, um, Wi-Fi connections, mm -hmm. can that be billed to CARES Act? If yeah. yeah, so the... Part of the confusing piece with CARES Act is I, I think there's like 50 separate buckets of CARES Act allocations. Um, there's the money that came directly to towns, there's money that went through health departments, fire departments, um, a bunch of different areas, and there's also money that went directly to schools. And so the schools have gotten some money directly from the CARES Act that they've used for some things like that. Um, we've also supported some technology purchases as well. Um, but yes, that, that type of purchase in terms of uh, remote learning, it's not FEMA eligible because it's not responding specifically to a health emergency, but it is CARES Act eligible. So would you be able, this came up last night um, when we were talking with Paul about COVID. Has anyone tried, if we said we have senior housing or where they're isolated because they can't go out anymore and they don't have wireless access, and this is an unusual time in the pandemic. Has anyone tested that kind of use for it? Um, what would it be? You mean like some sort of Wi-Fi? Yep. Uh, um, exactly. I haven't heard that yet, but I can, I guess I can connect with Paul on it. Um, you know, I know in some communities there's a push to, you know, particularly on the student front to, um, I think provide sort of free Wi-Fi or some sort of internet service during this time for families that don't have it. Um, I don't know if that's been discussed. Yeah, I'm thinking it'd be a combination of where we've got a lot of seniors living together, you know, Ann Whalen, and or affordable housing units, which may not have cable access. You know, there may be a cable line, but no. So I'm I'm just looking for a, it's expensive. And is this a way of jumpstarting wiring up Amherst in a way that we haven't been able to do um, because we haven't had the money to do it? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll connect with Paul on, on that one and get more details. Okay. And the nice thing is that the care, the state has set up like a CARES Act request hotline um, throughout this whole thing. So there's a specific email address around eligibility. So if things come up, um, we can just reach out to them and find out if it's eligible or not. Yeah, because well, I'm sure it's the, you have the same inclination. If we can get as much as three, try to get it. You know, so, you know, but for things we genuinely want, um, yeah. but try to test the waters. Yep. So I had a, a completely unrelated question. So I'll wait to see if anyone wants COVID, uh, this link. Okay, so when you talked about grants from the state are coming in level um, or uh, state aid, what about the amount of money we get for roads, that 840,000? Um, is that coming in? And that was a question mark as of June, whether we would get as much any and do we know or when will we know? Yeah, I think we, Sonia, um, I don't know if you remember this. I think we got that confirmation of the number. Um, and I think it's in line with what we were budgeting. Um, right. going the year. I don't, you know, there originally was hope that there was going to be a big increase in that number this year. Um, I think that originally was what the state was hoping to do was to increase that allocation. But after COVID happened, I believe they, they kept it level. So I'll double check that um, and I can send that out to the group what our number was for the year. Okay, and that'd be great to have that for next week's JCPC meeting because it was a uh, how much will we have to spend on roads and sidewalks and that was clearly a big piece of it if with the question mark are we going to get it all. Yeah. In the, in the 
the budget we adopted was based on level funding. Yep. Third. Um, yep. Dorothy? Oh, just to follow up on the uh, internet idea. So talking about doing whole buildings and certainly the easiest ones to justify would be uh, Ann Whalen and uh, what's the other house right next to it? The two, two senior buildings um, downtown. Um, because, you know, when you, when you depend upon a, a patchwork of, when my mother was in a home, it was a very nice home, okay? But they didn't have wireless for everybody. So it was just those people who either had, felt it was necessary or had money for it, which meant that most people didn't have it and it was expensive. But the question that I'm, I started to talk about this with Paul once, there's a question of staying within the system we have and then somehow paying for buildings to get wired or, and treated, or there's some other system or some other way to go that maybe some people have been thinking about. Um, so I wanna know whether Sean has any idea of what that could be. Um, this Sean probably doesn't. The other Sean might have more information on that. Sean Hannon can probably, um, and we can talk, talk to him later. Uh, he probably has uh, a better thought on that. Okay, I'm gonna turn it off to try and move us along to the next agenda item in a second. The, uh, of course, we're dealing with the INET installation now. And the question is, as we install a new INET, what additional can we do with it? And I think that is um, a question for the other, Sean, because uh, there's questions of what it is we're permitted to do with the agreements that are necessary in order to use um, the poles that belong to the current carriers to place our INET. And if we start using the INET for things other than that they don't view as specific town purposes, the current connectivity of town buildings, uh, whether there will be, that would add to the cost, whether they would start charging us for use of the poles, which I think that they're not using, doing now. Uh, so it really is a question that we would have to ask IT. Um, anything else on the, this because, um, what I'd like to do, um, Athena, I, um, I think it's okay to, and it would actually be helpful to bring Darcy into the meeting um, for the next agenda item um, because it has a um, piece that is uh, connected. So Darcy, you with us? Sorry to see you. Andy, I just want to mention, I seem to be having a great deal of difficulty with my computer. And so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to bring up documents. Okay, then I will uh, take over if I have to. To um, It's harder to do it as I'm chairing because then I lose sight on who's got hands up, as you know. Andy, if you want me to do it, I can do it as well. If there's... there's one piece that I'm going to that only uh, Lynn and I have because we didn't prepare it in advance. Um, but Darcy, hello. And uh, I wanted to just acknowledge that uh, Darcy's present for two different agenda items today. I asked her since she was gonna be here anyway to talk about ECAC, if she wanted to be involved in, uh, or at least present for the discussion we're gonna have briefly about the capital inventory. And just as a reminder, and you've received uh, Paul Bachleman's uh, memo to the town council that then uh, was referred last night to us. And what he's asking for is that um, we, as a council, uh, make a recommendation on a topic and that that is what's been referred to the finance committee to do the thinking and development for the council. And what it has to do with is the uh, section 5.7A of the charter uh, that includes the, the town manager in consultation. Let's see if I get to the right sentence. Um, but it has to do with the inventory. Uh, 
that the town manager in consultation with superintendent of schools library director shall establish and update an inventory of significant capital assets of the town, including those assets under the jurisdiction of the school committee and library trustees, such as buildings, infrastructure for water, sewer, stormwater, as well as roads, vehicles, movable equipment, and such other property as determined by the town council. The town council shall establish the requirements for the inventory, such as age, condition, maintenance and repair history, remaining useful life, and other features of the, uh, as the council may deem appropriate. So that is the key uh, section of the charter that uh, we're, uh, Paul has asked for the council, the council has asked us to assist in developing um, a response to what should be in the inventory. When I've discussed this with Sonia and Sean, we uh, recognize that the, uh, the, we don't have to do it all at once and may not be able to do it all at once. And that the uh, inventory that we do in, the, in, in this next year uh, may not hit on all items, but we at least want to think broadly as far as where we're going in the long run, but we definitely need to be mindful of what the staff is capable of providing to us. So that's, um, this is a very preliminary part of the discussion. And I don't know, Lynn, if you had anything else you want to add before I get into the process um, recommendation. No, I actually think uh, this is, you've hit it, that this may be a multi-year process so that we go for the large items and the large picture first and then work down. So what I'm gonna try and do now, it's always um, a challenge to get this right, um, is uh, to do a share screen of um, see if I can get to the right piece on the the screen that I I want to share with you and um, I have given some consideration to uh, the question of what is process we might want to consider and how to go about doing this so. Um, you should now see on your screen um, what I have developed and is an addition is an initial discussion item to help us think through what the steps would be that we would need to go through in well, order to implement um, uh, and actually uh, do what has been asked of us to do. Can you I make it larger, Andy? I certainly can try. Let's see if I can get it lower. Is that better? Yeah, marginally. That's better. It's much better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that uh, you can see it all and if your if faces are not in the way, which it is on my screen. Um, what um, we would be talking about is um, to have the committee start the discussion in general terms to see what we want to include. Um, and uh, then um, as a second step, that we would ask other multi-member bodies, which would include uh, JCPC and ECAC um, about specific suggestions that they would have about information that uh, should be considered for the inventory. And uh, ECAC, I think has been giving a little bit of thought to the subject and uh, when, if we if we go ahead and ask them, we'll ask for more, since uh, Darcy was uh, going to be present for the next for another agenda item, I thought that she uh, 
might have some comments that you would offer to us um, as we um, got into that part of the, or got into the discussion. Other things that would of course happen later is that the Finance Committee would put together an initial list of the information that would be sought. Then we would ask the staff for their comments on feasibility and the time requirement in order to be able to process what is really a feasible request for this year and what might be desirable but um, to be placed in to future year inventory requests and then to um, use all of that information as a basis for a report. So with that in mind, that is the um, suggestion that I thought it would be worth starting with. And um, so if I, because I'm the one who's sharing, I cannot see now participant list to see if there are any hands. So Kathy maybe Kathy has her can hand up. An eye on, on, on who has hands up and she has a first comment in, our, in any event. So I'll let her start and then she can recognize other hands. Kathy? Okay, and you know I can see I've got three columns here. Yours, um, so I'm I'm chair of JCPC, and we meet next week on Wednesday, and I believe Sean is planning on at least giving us the preliminary look at the capital inventory next week on where they are. So I thought the way you've set this up makes a lot of sense to start a discussion today in finance bring a preliminary, you know, just a simple bu bulleted list of what's already included and then have people start to add to it. So I, I started thinking about this a while ago and um, looked at the list that was in the charter, you know, to think of what else we might want to have and um, just a few things that I had, and I don't know whether we want to generate a list today, Andy, take some notes, and then feed it back to the committee next time we meet. So I don't know what your process is, but I'll just give you the kinds of things that I thought of is make sure we have a dollar value. Um, so we normally do it on vehicles, so we have some evaluation. Um, when I get to vehicles, to want to know how many miles it was driven in the last year. So not just how many miles are on it. Um, if we can start doing that so we can see heavily used, less used, whether it's an electric vehicle slash or a hybrid vehicle, one more categorization of it. Um, and then the other one that is, I think it's part of the capital inventory, but when I'm thinking of buildings, to the extent we have buildings that we're not currently using that we own, a column that would be comments on any plan uh, for disposition of it, or if there's nothing, it could say no plan for disposition. So the ones I know, for example, would be the old Hitchcock Center that's sitting there empty um, and is owned. So owned, these are public buildings, just a list of the public buildings. One we transferred, the East Greet School. So it's a different category of buildings that the, not being currently used. So those are the kinds of things I started thinking about that might not be in the same category that the um, charter lists them in. They might be a separate, I think of them as spreadsheet pages or whatever, um, since vehicles clearly are a very long list, um, but then when we get to buildings and equipment. So I'll just stop there, but I didn't know what process you were thinking of. Like those are several ideas I could be typing now if people throw out other ideas or we have everyone send you a list and you compile a list so whatever you had in mind um and then i'm signing off because i'm sure others who had their hands up have also been thinking about this okay why don't you go ahead because you have the participant list in front of you okay, i think lynn's hand was up after mine then i have lynn then dorothy then darcy I think Bernie, who, Bernie, do you know about uh, raise hands on the? Um, okay, but well, Bernie, I've made, yeah, I've literally been raising my hands, but um, yeah, you were, but you know what I'm looking at is as the blue hand comes up on the raise hand, which is on the either bottom left or bottom right, I can see the order. So that's the. Um, mm -hmm. if it's hard. Okay, I don't see. I don't see raised hands on my. You have to go screen. to participants. Under participants, yeah. Okay. 
Go click yep. on it. And then, and then you okay, so I'll do that. Okay, then Bernie. <laughs> and it's just hard otherwise because I can't see a physical hand and figure who's came up first. So Lynn, Dorothy, Darcy, Bernie. All right. So I I want to just be straightforward. Doing an inventory is something we should not be reinventing the wheel on. Uh, large institutions like the universities and any other institution that has to account for their inventory have ways in which they do this and they have measures by which they do this. And I'm sure there are other towns as well. And so for us to sit here and say, well, we should look at blah, 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 blah. And I'm, I'm trying not even to get into it. I right. think it is not the best use of the full committee's time. Um, I think there are ways in which we can look for models to do this. There may even be software out there that already allows you to do this. Um, I've certainly, in my years with the university, was regularly asked for any part of the inventory I had in my own personal possession, like a computer, et cetera. So I, I really want to discourage us from sitting here and essentially um, trying to create an inventory from scratch. Dorothy. Dorothy. Hmm. Um, I think that's a good suggestion, but I do think maybe some things might have changed. I thought of this inventory and I thought what an incredible device would be looking back over time to see how things have changed. So that when you mention a vehicle, I think you should include um, horsepower and miles per gallon when you enter a technological device. And of course the date of, of its purchased, um, the, the size of the memory or whatever is the, what some of those units because, and then you should have energy cost in there. Um, and we would see, I hope, a, a great change and a progression as we go through it. Um, you could have, and I'm sure that uh, Lynn is right, there's a, actually probably formulas on this, but estimated time of, of a replacement, which of course is you know just guesswork, but there's some better guesswork than others. So I just think it would be makes very important to have certain details of the technology and of the energy costs to be included in the inventory. Uh, Darcy. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I'm here kind of speaking on behalf of ECAC. I, I had a brief conversation with Andy and at the last uh, Energy and Climate Action Committee meeting, I, I brought up that, that the town is gonna to be looking at the capital inventory and it sort of dovetails with the process that we're going through with our climate action planning and also with our, you know, like we're going to be regularly needing to do a greenhouse gas inventory, which will involve looking at all those different things. Um, I believe it's every two years. Um, and so I did talk to Stephanie because of not wanting to reinvent the wheel. And she, of course, she already does some of this stuff through green communities requirements. Um, and that I put a couple things in the, I asked Andy to put a couple things in the packet that she had provided, including that list of vehicles that she needed to gather um, because of green communities requirements. So um, I, uh, I did, uh, talk to ECAC about it and they um, are going to probably be suggesting a few additional criteria that we might use um, that would be things like, you know, lifetime energy usage or um, plan, you know, what, what year it, the plan is to transition whatever it is to um, off fossil fuels if it's a vehicle or something like that. Um, so uh, we don't have it right now to give you, so, but um, I will be um, talking more to Stephanie about it. And, and I believe that uh, I'm interested in knowing what your time frame is here uh, and when you would need to hear from ECAC um, to, to get input from them. Okay. Um, 
for calling on Bernie. Uh, just a couple of comments on the, the things that we've heard. I, um, Lynn raises a good point about what the purpose of the inventory is and um, the need to be cognizant of uh, not wanting to go farther uh, without, at least without good cause than is uh, currently provided in inventory. This is tied to the capital um, section the, uh, of the financial part of the uh, charter. So um, I would suggest looking at the charter to, as a, in its entirety in that financial section and uh, where the inventory fits in because I think that it really is tied very much to JCPC and to assist the capital planning process, it has to do with the capital plan initially. Uh, but there is the question of, uh, as you develop a capital plan and what it is you want to put into the equipment list, it kind of gets back to some of the things that ECAC has been talking about, which is what the town can do to uh, reduce its carbon footprint. If I don't have this right, Darcy's going to come in and tell me that. Uh, but uh, in order to, as we talk about reducing the carbon footprint, and that is um, also something that JCPC is going to be encouraged to start to think about, then you get into the question of what information that is needed in order to make that application. And of course, JCPC makes a recommendation to the town manager, and then the town manager is ultimately the one who puts together the capital plan based upon a recommendation from the Joint Capital Planning Committee. So that's what the process is. And I think we're where this fits together. And um, with that, Bernie, you had asked, you had something that you remarked. Yeah, I just look on, yeah. I mean, the first task is to define what significant capital, significant capital asset is. Uh, I, I don't recall it's out of my head what you know what uh, the definition JCPC is using, and it may well have changed since I sat on that committee. Uh, but that might be a place to start. Uh, I, I agree wholeheartedly that a capital inventory and a capital improvement program just is is absolutely essential. Uh, but I would second Lynn's point that there's probably ways to do this uh, that other organizations have come up with that we could crib rather than create our own. And I'd be careful not to layer on too much, at least on the first pass, because if you do that, it's going to become an onerous task. It's going to be an onerous task to begin with. But if you if you layer on too many requirements, how many watts does each PC the town owns draw, for example, um, you, you're gonna you're gonna really discourage people. And I I, I think um, there are other ways to make that. Uh, to, to bring in the, uh, the the energy conservation, the green communities piece, um, you know, one of the things that come to mind is you set a floor as to what uh, you know, you know, uh, minimum standards that uh, a piece of equipment has to meet in terms of energy consumption, for example, rather than worrying initially about how what each one is. Uh, so that's that's a couple of points. The other thing is. Um, Speaking from experience, it would be real helpful if we have a structure um, to note if it's included on the town's insurance and what the insurance value is. Um, that frequently gets overlooked. And uh, um, I, I think that's an important piece of information. I, I, the last town I was in, we started this process and they were shocked, shocked, shocked to find that their insurance value or their buildings didn't come anywhere near close to covering replacement value. So um, you you want to you want to take that into account as well. But where you start is what what is what's significant. Um, I'm sure Guilford, uh, if he's still listening or he's going to jump in, can tell us about what software they use to uh, manage the town's fleets, and what information is already on hand in terms of uh, um, of, of mileage and, and other factors that um, we'd all find important. Yeah. Um, Kathy? 
Yeah, I, I totally agree, Lynn. I didn't mean to start out with minutia. Um, and I also think, you know, what everyone is saying is the decide what's significant and then ease of keeping it up to date. You know, we don't want to have uh, lose all of Sean McNano as he every year tries to race to update this thing, you know. So to the extent we could automate that the information is in one database and it just populates this. So we've got it in an insurance battery. Or I'm thinking with car inspections, my insurer knows how many miles I drove every year because every time I get the car inspected, it's something that's getting reported. So there's probably some ways that other towns have figured out how to capture things without making it labor intensive and time intensive. Um, and that, that would be, um, cause the charter says do this and update it annually. So we're not in a like do it once and five years later, come on and do it. So we have to have something that we can maintain um, and that provides use to us. So, um what you're looking at, and I'm about to take off the screen in a couple of, or take it off in a few minutes, is really a, a process that involves multiple steps that we do need to assign dates to, because to get back to a question that Darcy had raised, uh, step two is that the committee asks um, multi-member bodies um, if they have specific suggestions about information to include in the inventory. We have to to agree that we're going to take that step and set a due date. But um, on the first step, uh, discussing general terms, what to include, uh, we're starting that discussion a little bit now. But I think that what I'm hearing is, is that it would be very helpful, not today, but it, um, possibly the next meeting or the meeting after, to ask uh, Sean or Sonia to do a presentation of what the current inventory consists of and provide that information to us uh, in, in whatever format they think is most useful. And then we see what is currently done and uh, we can move forward uh, building on that um, because uh, that's a system in place. John has his hand up in. And that's all part of who does? John does. So I think, yeah, I'm just letting you know that, you know, he is hearing you. <laughs> yeah, his hand is up. Yeah. I don't know, Lynn, Lynn was up before me. I didn't know if Lynn wanted to go first. Oh, I, you know, I, I think we need to start with what we have. And then we need to decide some additional parameters. You know, this may not be relevant in a town operation but in a grant and contract operation, for example, we always had to keep track of what did the federal, federal government actually own? What was the federal share? Those kinds of things. But I think we really need to start with looking at our professional staff. What do they want to recommend to us in terms of um, what we have and how we move forward? The shot. Uh, I just had some thoughts on the timeline. I think that was brought up. Um, I, I think one way to think about this is that this inventory supports the capital improvement program or that it informs the capital improvement program each year. Um, so I would want it to be done before we really start digging into the capital improvement program so we can use this as a basis. So in terms of timing, I feel like the December, January would be a good time frame to have this inventory updated each year. Um, Again, that would give us all the data in terms of vehicles, how old they are, their condition, the buildings, all that would be in place so that when we start putting the capital improvement program together in early, uh, late winter, early spring, it'll be together. Because um, they, they kind of go hand in hand, this inventory in, the, in that program. So um, that would be my recommendation in terms of time and would be try to, whatever work the committee does, try to have um, a recommendation that we can go forward with um, by you know, late December so we can get it together for January. So it seemed then, uh, let me test this out, that what we would want to do is um, get the report at the next meeting on what it is that's in the current inventory, um, what, you would, uh, what you do already now, and uh, 
but we go ahead and uh, ask JCPC, uh, ECAC, and any other committees that might be recommended, which I'm going to come to as next topic, and then start to um, get to step two of the process of getting that request out. Uh, because what we want to do as quickly as we po as possible is come into a conclusion about whether there are any high priority issues that would need to be considered for this next round, which Sean was just referring to, to try and limit any additional requests above what is currently being done, because it's going to get late in the year and um, get into the middle of the budget process and to do major changes right now, as uh, Sonia pointed out to me once before, is going to be difficult. So any comments on that? If not, then uh, I think what I would suggest is that uh, when we get to the next agenda items farther down on the list, that we um, come back to this question so that we get everything uh, we, as we develop our schedule, uh, it is placed in its uh, proper proper location and uh, in the schedule so that we can get the work done this year. What we're trying to do out of today's meeting is to some extent just develop our work plan for the uh, next six months as we get through the beginnings of the budget development process. And uh, that's all part of it. Anything else on that? Because if not, uh, I'm going to turn to the next agenda item, which is um, the um, ECAC um, question and what we had, um, I'm trying to get to where my um, piece is, um, that we um, was a present. Uh, so it was a presentation by ECAC on its goals and plans was what, what this was about. And um, the uh, uh, basic um, of it is, is that Dorothy had come to me some time ago and Stephanie Ciccarello, and this goes back to pre-COVID days, asking to make this presentation and then we quit having in-person meetings except for essential purposes. And we got into the budget crisis so that we didn't get to it. And uh, so we're really back to um, ECAC and what our thinking is. And uh, with that, I turn it over to Darcy. Thank you. Um, I um, would just start by reminding Everybody, I guess not everyone is might be aware of the fact that the council um, that the ECAC was formed, um, you know, very soon after the council started in, and um, uh, we we uh, were formed by, um, in May of 2019. Um, actually had our first meeting in May of 2019 and then we were able to come back to the council with proposed goals in November of 2019 and the the council adopted um, pretty pretty aggressive goals of 25% uh, emissions reduction by 2025 um, 50% reduction by 2030 and carbon neutral by 2050. So, and then of course, the job of the ECAC was to try to come up with some, a plan uh, for how we're going to do this. So one of the big focuses of the climate action planning that we're doing right now is to be able to come back to the council with a plan to initially get us um, to have a 25% emissions reduction by 2025. And also uh, a number of different actions so that the town can be more resilient. 
Um, so I'd like to kind of pull up the um, the timeline if um, should I do that or I can do it if you'd like. I think you it was one of the documents that you sent to us. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, maybe I should do it because then I can manipulate it. Um, okay. Go ahead if, then. If uh, if can anybody is anybody invited to do this? <laughs> you have to go in the bottom and do share screen. The bottom of the black. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to your cursor over the bottom and if it's there it'll show up. It's on mine it's a little green button that says share screen right between participants and record. So you don't see it right now? Your screen you have to do share screen then you have to pick the screen you're sharing. Right. No, I thought I did that, but I guess Don't I didn't. Don't forget, you you click uh, your screen uh, sorry, and then yeah, you I'm click the bottom and button that says share. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. So I think, let's see if I... Uh, if you let someone else share it, Darcy, you can cue them to how fast you want them to go. Okay, I think it you should it should be on your screen now what you're discussing, correct? All right. Okay. Thank you, Andy. So um, uh, this uh, timeline started with um, well, one thing that needs to be explained is that we kind of have two parallel processes going on at one time. The ECAC in its charge is required to come back with a climate action plan to the council. Um, and at the same time, we have our municipal vulnerability preparedness program uh, sort of operating in parallel. Um, and that has been the way that we've been able to fund um, having consultants to help do the outreach and um, help put the plan together. So we're working with Linnaean Solutions uh, to do that. And they, we got started with them um, just at about the time that COVID hit. And we were, were not able to get our, um, our, you know, we we initially thought we were going to be able to get everything done by the end of the last fiscal year. Uh, but COVID really got in our way. And also some of the timing of the funding deadlines did. So we are, we sort of got pushed into FY21. And um, so this whole timeline is pretty much in the next fiscal year. So um, right now we're in the middle of doing our, our um, outreach uh, and we created four task groups. And the, some of this you heard when Stephanie and Laura came to the town council, uh, but they didn't, they didn't take much time. It was at the end of a meeting and <laughs> no one asked any questions. Um, but uh, so we have four task groups going and we've invited people, stakeholders in the town to participate in one about uh, electricity, which is focusing primarily on uh, community choice aggregation one on buildings, um, one on land use and zoning, and the fourth one is about transportation, um, waste, communications, and public health. So that's quite a, quite a mix in that last group. Uh, but those groups are going to be each coming up with a set of, of action plans. And, um, you know, we've been looking at plans from other towns and uh, what they have been proposing. Um, one town that has come up with a, a plan just recently is Concord. They have a comparable population and they are, um, they just finished their plan. They also did it through the MVP process. Um, and so theirs, theirs um, will probably inform ours to some extent, um, although it doesn't have as much of an element of 
climate justice and equity as ours is um, incorporating now. So um, our, our task groups are including uh, not just the local experts on the subject areas, but they also have included, um, they reached out to community members of color um, who are participating in each one of the task groups. So that's been real, really um, actually pretty cutting edge as far as the, the way that we're going about it. But anyway, each one of these task groups is going to be coming up with a separate set of plans to go forward. Um, and as we go, if you um, see in phase three, we're going to be doing in once the, the community meetings are over, um, we're going to be working on priority setting, uh, looking at the actions that um, appear to be priority actions and figuring out, trying to narrow them down to see uh, which are the ones that make the most sense to be putting forward. Um, so that we're hoping to have happen in October and November and to have it coincide with what's going to be the ECAC's annual report. The annual report is supposed to include uh, a funding um, aspect to it, a funding request. So we're going to try to combine that this year with the initial piece of the Climate Action Plan where we hope to have already gotten through the prioritizing part and to be able to come up with some kind of a, um, a draft budget request uh, in, in uh, November, December area, somewhere around there. Um, and uh, obviously this year we're going to be looking a lot at, I mean, we're going to be trying to put together um, actions that can be, you know, that will be prioritized according to how fat, how soon they should be done. And this first group of trying to get things done before 2025 will, will be, um, you know, priority actions. One of them, you know, one of the big emissions reductions actions that we're really optimistic about is the community choice aggregation, obviously. That is moving slowly. Um, partly because it's, you know, the first step is to put together a joint powers agreement and that we hope is going to be, it's being put together with some lawyers with the aggregation plan. It has to be submitted to the DPU. And right now the DPU is not moving any faster than six months uh, uh, in their approvals of any of these applications. Some of them have some of the more innovative ones like ours is going to be, um, have taken as many as 18 months to get through the DPU. So um, we're, we, we're looking at CCA as being a major emissions reducer, but we're, we're seeing that it may take a while to, to get it up and running. So um, we also wanna look at every possible uh, you know, grant application possibility um, for emissions reductions. And, um, and like I said, each one of the topic subject areas is going to be coming forward with, you know, actions in buildings, actions in zoning, actions in, um, in um, uh, transportation, especially. So, um, then uh, if, if you scroll down, Andy, um, the, the final, final, final plan is uh, not going to be submitted. The, the plan is that it's not going to be submitted until April um, so that it will coincide with the budget process for, for uh, the town. So, um, uh, I can also talk about our, our previous budget request that we made um, in February. Um, 
if uh, but if people have questions about this, I could take them now. Uh, Kathy, uh, keep your eye and hands up for. Uh, uh, yeah, I see Lynn's hand. If I'm mute. Lynn has her hand up. Um, so, I, it, knowing the budget process, um, I want to make sure that um, your budget request is in long before April. Um, Sean and um, Sonia can give a much better sense of when they start building the budget. And it's going to be useful to know early on what categories, what departments, uh, and the kinds of requests you're going to be wanting to make. Uh, but to wait until um, uh, April. No, we're, the, the intention is to, to have something in draft um, when, we, when we submit our annual report in okay. December. Okay, thanks for that clarification. And I guess I want to go back to Sean and, and uh, Sonia and just say, is that sufficient time? I would, Sonia, I, don't, I can't see you, so I don't know if you were going to add something. I was thinking the same thing as you, Lynn. Um, December, November would be better because then it could be part of the Finance Committee's budget guidelines um, or the, the budget guidelines of the council um, that come out of the Finance Committee if that information you know, if the Finance Committee had that information, that would help them consider that when they issue those, um, those recommendations to the council. Yeah. I, will, I will pass that on to the committee, and that's basically what I've been suggesting to them, so. Right. And I, um, I and add. So maybe I'll take a moment on that and then I uh, have get back to Kathy, um, it says, if I may. Uh, so the traditional budget process that is built into the charter and into state statute, which we didn't follow this year because of the exceptional circumstances. Um, and I'm, you know, it's, an, it's a coming agenda item on today's agenda, but it basically gets down to the fact that if we assume that the governor's um, emergency order will be lifted before we get to the budget process. We have to adhere to state statute and state statute is tied to the charter. So going back to what that is, make that an assumption. Uh, what we normally do is in roughly November, October, November, uh, that the finance director and town manager present uh, projected uh, revenue projections for the year ahead because um, the budget gets built on uh, what resources are available. Uh, we, as a finance committee, go over the revenue projections. Uh, the revenue projections, which are presented actually to the council um, as a whole, as they were every year and they were last year, uh, twice, as it turns out. Uh, include suggestions about sort of the broad allocations, which really are the, the major buckets of uh, municipal schools and library capital and uh, what's needed for debt service, uh, sort of the very major pieces. Um, and all of that gets used by the Finance Committee in developing um, the guidelines and we put forward the guidelines with, her, with uh, our suggestions as to what are the highest priorities. In the um, FY21 original guidelines, which you've seen many times because the council is, ultimately adopts the guidelines, they're only recommended by the finance committee. Uh, the ECAC recommendation was bundled with about four, four other topics along the lines of saying to the town manager, we want you to think about these if additional funds become available and what costs would be required. So it's uh, much uh, less specific than I think that you're looking to include this year. And, uh, but we uh, try and get those guidelines done for uh, December, January, um, and that includes 
council action because of, by then, uh, Sean and uh, Sonia and Paul are meeting with the department heads to try and actually structure the municipal portion of the budget, uh, which doesn't come back to the council until uh, May 1st. And then after May 1st, we're into the, to the races where we review the budget and um, can subtract but not add. If so, if we want to include something in the budget or want to make or, or want to ask the town manager to consider something for the budget, um, we try and get those in the guidelines. And, um, you know, that's the same process that is used in all cities across the state. It's not unique to us. Um, so that's basically the overview, Sean or Sonia. Anything you want to add? No, that, that was good. If Only not, that, um, Andy, I think there's also a budget forum, right? Sometime in November or December is what the council started to do. November. Okay. Yeah, we did it last year. Was done on the same night as the uh, projections meeting. Okay. Right. So that we did the projections meeting and then we followed with the forum in the same evening. Yeah, I, I really that I Darcy, I think that it would be useful for um, me to also meet with uh, Laura and the vice chair um, and you as well, because in order for you to come forward to the council with something that they're gonna buy into, we're going to need a lot more sense of where the plan is going. And so we need to start backtracking to even get to the point that by November, are so the council is ready to buy into costs so um, and concepts that go into the guidelines. So let's just put that aside. That's not part of the finance committee, but it's part of the overall approach of how you bring something like this up through the council and get the buy-in that needs to happen. Right. Kathy? Okay, and I just remember there are, are at least one other timeline and potentially two. The other timeline is the capital projects and capital requests. There is a vehicle, as you know, that's a resident capital request that can be submitted. JCPC will start meeting um, probably February, but Sean can tell us when the opening is for resident capital requests. There's a, um, an earlier submit your requests now, but there are, if there are specific that could come through a department, you know, so rather than be a resident request that they could come because it's coming from police or fire about a car, you know, or schools, um, getting that in much earlier because those requests come up through the departments, you know, so we get we get a, a wish list of capital needs that's pri prioritized. So, you know, thinking in terms of there's a different stream and it's gonna depend on how much we have. We, we just slashed it um, severely the, for this current fiscal year. So then the other one um, is the Community Preservation Act. And I think right now there really aren't any categories that these kinds of initiatives um, fit nat naturally into, unless it was an affordable housing project wanting to retool for energy purposes, it might fit, you know? So trying to think of it, it's another part of money and they will start doing requests for proposals very soon. They're gonna open up for um, allocations. And my final thought, this is more on the policy legislative front, I'm not sure why um, we couldn't start thinking of approaching a, a Mindy and Joe and other leaders at, in Boston level saying, if we're talking about community preservation, could um, sustainability be one of the categories? Because it's not one right now. It's got housing, public lands, um, recreation, um, and historic. So it fits with the notion of preservation, but I think it would take it's not like you'd get it tomorrow, but I think there'd be a receptive ear and multiple ears at the legislative level that would open up that pot of money to have another purpose over time that could be drawn on. And it's taxpayer money, 
and it's something that we all benefit from. So it fits naturally. So those are just, there's something different than the operating budget that's working on a different timeline with two, two allocations to be thinking about and large and small, they can be pretty small um, awards or grant requests. So the, any change was really a long-term multi-year out question because it requires a substantial change in the existing legislation and uh, one that is not going to be without enemies uh, who are going to argue against uh, changing that list of purposes. Yeah, I don't think, I didn't think that was easy. And it may be that going just to an allocation for this purpose will be easier. It's just, it's money that um, in some years, we probably spend it on things that there were, would have been higher priority projects if we could have spent them on and they just didn't fit in the categories. Um, so it's, it's, I think of all of this as long-term thinking. Um, so I want to um, get back to the people whose hands are up. And He's then up and then Dorsey. Bernie. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not no longer sharing, so I can see Tim Bernie. Yeah, um, I think the suggestion of looking to add sustainability to the CPA is a great one, and one that may be an easier lift than we're all thinking, given um, <clears throat> that uh, the CPA is running into limits in terms of the larger communities in terms of what they could spend the money on. So uh, having a preservation component or a sustainability component would be, um, I think, welcome in a lot of places. Uh, the other thing I was reminded that Mark Twain said that continuous improvement is preferable to delayed perfection and that we could have had uh, a community choice aggregation plan in place by now. And that that really uh, sort of a garden variety uh, uh, CCA that uh, uh, gets us green energy uh, uh, should be considered while we're waiting for that whole process of the joint powers agreement and creating another Cape Light goes forward because that will that will take a long time. But um, a uh, uh, you know a sort of plain vanilla community choice aggregation can happen in months, relatively relatively shortly. So Darcy, your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um... Uh, I don't know whether we have time for me to, to pull up the other document that was our, our budget request, but the main thing that I wanted to talk about, about that, uh, our request that we put in February of 2020 um, was to support the, the last year's resident capital request for a solar study at the middle and high school and to study all the rooftops of all the municipal buildings for solar capacity um, and park, rooftops and parking lots. Um, so um, at one point, um, well, I guess my question is, um, and I asked Sean at some other meeting that I can't, I can't remember when, but, um, whether um, the resident capital request that didn't get granted in the last fiscal year, is it automatically carried over? Or, um, and is there any possibility of the, that money that you said that is, has been carried over from the reserves from last year into the FY21 budget? Is there any possibility of that being something that could go forward because it's just a study that is, you know, a precursor to a bigger project, but it would be just being, you know, it would be able to get it started and it isn't that expensive. Sean? Yeah, um, so I think it can be carried over. I don't think they necessarily have to resubmit, um, you know, if it takes till the next round uh, because it wasn't, I don't believe, um, JCPC rejected it. It was just sort of delayed. Um, and I sent an email to the requesters, which, you know, essentially said, I think it's, it's too early for us to look at allocating any of those funds um, because we still don't know what the federal government's doing. We don't really know our local receipt situation yet until we get the first quarter in the books. Um, 
we don't know what UMass is going to look like for the second semester. So we're trying to hold a little bit on that until we have a better picture of this year. Do you know if there if there was a way to um, to raise money uh, that wasn't municipal or state money to do a project like this, mm -hmm. like matching funds, similar to you know the matching funds for the North Amherst Library, if there was a way to raise funds to do this study, um, would would that be something that that um, uh, the town would be interested in? Um, I, I could talk it over with Paul. I mean, we do receive donations all the time for sort of specific purposes. Um, you know, we can receive gifts. And so, yeah, I think, you know, if there was a donation or if there's money raised, it would be definitely something, you know, the town would want to consider. Yeah, I mean, it basically it would mean that you would be interested in the larger project that yeah. was being studied. So. Mm -hmm. My yeah, recollection is the, the region had it in their capital plan as well to begin with, and then the, the regional schools, um, and then they had to pull it out when everything COVID sort of happened. So um, same thing with them. I don't think it necessarily was sort of rejected by them. I think they just had to recalibrate once all the, the fallout happened. Right. Sean, can you just uh, pick this up with Darcy after you've had a chance to talk yeah. to Paul? Because sure. we probably need to move on to the next agenda item. Okay. Is there any other comments or anything else, Darcy, in conclusion? I really um, appreciate the, uh, that you gave us the overview. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And um, I'll probably talk to you more about the capital inventory issue um, since, I, since ECAC is probably going to give you some input about that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I will own, sign off. Okay, thank you. And to our own committee. Um, I would encourage you to look at the other documents that Darcy sent to us uh, for circulation, including the report that they did last year that had some information about their initial thoughts as of then about budget issues. I don't want to get into that now, but I think that uh, um, you should look at it for um, so that it lays the groundwork for um, what we're talking about. But um, what we need to get on to is uh, the rest of the work plan. And one other thing, and I'm going to um, ask Kathy again to come back on this, uh, which is uh, I'm skipping down for a moment to agenda item five, which is water and sewer rates, potential options to assess initial discussion. Um, because as you recall, on May 1st, a presentation was done uh, that was uh, arranged with the assistance of Guilford and Amy Rusecki at the uh, Department of Public Works so that we'd have a better understanding of the different ways that rates are structured. And then the, one of the questions that I think Kathy asked, as a matter of fact, at the time was, uh, if we're going to look at block rates or other mechanisms, what is the schedule that we need to be on in order to get the information developed for that purpose? And um, I think that the answer was, think about it in the fall. And so, um, Kathy, let me turn it over to you. Okay, Andy, I don't know whether you had time. I did two PowerPoint charts, um, but I can also just talk people through them. Um, um, if you don't want to share a screen. I don't know whether you got a chance to look at them. I have not had a chance. Um, if you think that they would be helpful to you and you can share a screen, I would say. Okay, so let me see, go ahead and, and do let me that. see whether Kathy can do this. Um, does that screen show? Yes, well, so, yes, it does. Okay, let me just get back to Zoom here so I can fix it. Um, okay, I don't want everything to show, right? <laughs> okay, so um, I want to do it on a slideshow, so there's only one. Okay, so I um, looked at what had been sent to us, and 
I tried to look at what kinds of variations um, we have to choose from. And so right now, Amherst has one single rate that doesn't vary except for agriculture um, on whether you're a small home or a major volume user such as UMass. And it doesn't vary by how much water you use either. Um, I mean, it varies. You spend more if you use more water, but it's one water rate. Um, so the things that were laid out, the options that were laid out to us, um, going from sort of simple concepts to more complex, is you could have a uniform rate um, divided by type of customer or type of user. And so the in other towns, it's residential versus commercial. But they said you could do this by you know, a small user versus a volume user with the examples being UMass colleges or, so it would be thumb, some threshold pays a higher rate per amount of water. So that's one possible variation from what we now have. A second would be within whatever category, whether it's the same for resident or high volume or not, you can set up block tiers where the rate goes up if you use more water, and this is an incentive to conserve. And in the presentation we had, we had several towns that were doing that. So both for residential and for the higher volume. And, and so there were a lot of variations in there that were interesting. In some cases, they did it just for residential and they had one uniform rate for commercial and said they had a variable rate by use level, so these block rates. And then another piece that was noted is that many jurisdictions do a fixed quarterly charge that doesn't vary with the amount you use. And it's basically, I think of it, um, I'm trained as an economist, I think of it as covering fixed costs. So even if everyone stops using, you still get some revenues. And we were given examples. Um, and so the town of Hadley has this. And so by a fixed quarterly rate, if a big user uses less. So our example this year would be UMass. You're still getting a quarterly payment that's based on, um, they were doing it based on the meter size. Bigger meters got charged more. So these are the variations that we were told um, are out there. And clearly you can do um, combinations. You could say we want to um, do ascending block rates to encourage cons uh, conservation, and you could do it just for small residences, just for high volume, or you could do different tiers. And we had in the slide chart um, higher tiers for the big users than for residential. Um, so it was an interesting set. And then again, with the fixed fee, they, we were given several towns that do this. And what you could see is by the fixed fee going through to all users um, that it meant that the amount you paid for use of water went down. You were covering part of your costs. So I, I just thought that out of the finance committee, we might want to think of um, what a handful of options or five to 10 that we would talk first to Guilford and Amy, of course, you know, what else are they thinking about that we'd like to see analyzed. So what difference would it make if we did, if we did, did A, B, or C, or combined a couple items. Um, and I, um, if I go to my second chart, um, I started thinking about what variants I might want to see, but this was just purely as a suggestion, you know, that start with what happens if we do a fixed quarterly charge, what happens to our homeowners rates and other rates. And that fixed quarterly charge seemed to vary by the, um, the meter size of the user. So bigger users got a bigger fixed quarterly charge. Um, and we have examples from both Hadley and Northampton. Then looking at this higher for volume, and I'm sure Guilford has already been playing for a lot of these. And I was thinking a couple variants for each of them. And then the last two were, suppose we did fixed quarterly with ascending block, or we did fixed quarterly with a uniform rate that varies by size. So I'm, I'm, I'll share this with everyone after the meeting. This was purely for people to start thinking about what variants we might want to see. And the only way I can think of, um, I'm 
I have never done modeling of water rates, but I used to have to think of healthcare expansion options. And we usually had some subcommittee getting to the smallest set we want to think about, talk to people that say, well, have you considered this or that? And then come back to committee saying, what do we want to see? And then have Guilford give us some answers that would purely be, um, what ifs, what happens if we did this? What happens if we did that? So that was my beginning thinking, having, having seen how many towns are doing something different than what we're doing. So we have all these real world examples where we can say, do something similar. Um, and I guess it was also sparked by watching what a huge impact UMass shutting down had for us on, as the volume of water use went down, we had difficulty. We had to increase the variable rate, the, the user rate for all residences because we weren't covering fixed costs. You know, the costs didn't go down very much. So that is why I think many places have moved to a, a quarterly charge that is helping them do that so that there aren't these big swings. It's a more stable revenue soon. And I'll start, stop there. Okay. I uh, see that Sharon's hands up and then I'll uh, see if Guilford has any follow-up uh, initial comments that he'd like to make, but Sharon? Kathy, thank you for that. I just have a, I just want to be clear um, when you talk about con uh, on the second slide. Um, so you can have the residential rate be um, like a tiered option and you can have the commercial or like the, you know, the university rate be a fixed quarterly option. So you can combine those different things or does everybody, if you choose a fixed rate, do you have to have a, you know, does okay. everybody have to be under some kind of fixed rate? Okay, so maybe I should, you know, I should make sure Guilford's not gonna correct me. The fixed quarterly charge doesn't cover use rate. You always have a fixed charge. So like you say, I'm gonna pay this much per quarter. And then as I use it, I'm gonna pay this much for my use. So it's always combined. Okay. With the other. So it's not like you get just one use. It's but, but adding you it in and in the slide we had that gave an example of Hadley, they had a $35 a quarter based on something. And that meant that their actual rate per cubic feet of water use was lower because they were getting that other stream of money. Yeah, I get that, but is it, can you, can you do that fixed rate for one category and whatever, but then for the other category of residential have a completely different way of assessing it? Or is it, if you choose to do a fixed rate, do you have to do it in all of the categories you have along with whatever else you're doing? Um, you I'm, I'm, I think I should turn this over to Guilford to to do that. So as I heard this, it was like a user, a user charge just for the, the um, fact, fact that you're connected. You know, so it's like you're connected and then we're going to also charge you for how much you use. We have a small user fee now in all of our bills, so it doesn't go to complete zero. So the, your question is, could you do it for just one category and not for the other? Um, I have no idea. All the towns that did this did it for both. So Guilford should come on for all of these, Andy. Guilford, do you want to say anything at this point? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can, I can say, say a few things. things. I mean, most of the fixed charge you see are just the reasons. Like, like Hadley has a meter charge. Meter charge. charge. Meter charge. Oh, Guilford, your mic's a little funky. Is, he, is it funky for other people? It's funky for me. Yes. Yeah. Definitely funky. Yes, definitely. The building. Oh, hey, now is this another uh, ploy to you know talk about the DPW building? Is that <laughs> <laughs> is that is that, is that better? better? No. Yeah. Uh, that's... Can you call in and maybe? I will go out and come back in. Okay. Uh, well, he's. Uh, Dropping out of uh, running uh, for a moment, Bernie. Uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm. I'm very familiar with the uh, 
the Hadley uh, options because I was the administrator when we put that in place. Uh, so we're going back sometime. I would encourage people to go to the Hadley website and look at their uh, explanation because it's somewhat more detailed than what's in the TNH report, the, the slides, the TNH slides that we're, we're seeing. Uh, but um, and Hadley's got a little bit more of a complicated, uh, uh, the fixed charge, the attachment fee uh, varies by meter size. And then there's tiers for water usage um, a residential tier, an agricultural tier, and a commercial tier. Uh, the commercial tier was really aimed at looking at the malls and what they were, what they were using. Um, it does, um, it doesn't necessarily increase the water bill that a homeowner has. Uh, there might be some increase, but it doesn't actually do that because, uh, as Kathy correctly pointed out, you're covering a lot of your fixed costs with that user fee, attachment fee, whatever you want to call it. So I, I, I think it's, um, um, I'd endorse it because I helped set it up. <laughs> I guess the difference, oh, okay. Yeah. Hand up. I know Gilford is back now. Okay. Well, you guys can keep going. Okay, Lynn? I guess the difference is, first of all, we don't have enough commercial property, property to talk about. What we do have, though, is some very large rental units that, and, and I think this is, you know, again, where Guilford comes in and says, you know, either they are individually metered units or the water and sewer are part of, um, you know, a, a, a rent charge or something. But the thing that you're going to hear from the council when it gets to some of that is that those will be costs that will then be passed on to, in many instances, more lower income people. And so there's resistance against that. And yet those apartment complexes, um, many of, you know, are actually some of our other bigger water uses. And so in many ways, they almost substitute for not having commercial property per se. And so I think as we look at this, we have to look at the issue of how many units is considered to be part of a resident uh, as well. And then another piece that I want to just keep in mind, and that is that there's all, there are two complications. One is at some point in time over the years, UMass has periodically said something about, you know, drilling their own wells and becoming their own water supply. And Guilford, I'm sure you know a whole lot more about that. But then there's also the problem of what happens if Hampshire College goes down and the whole issue of the water that goes through there. So I just want to make sure people understand the various um, nuances of how we're different, if you will, from Hadley and some of the other institutional issues since they are they are our biggest single water user. One of the things you might want to do is go back and look at Northampton when they set up their split water rates because North can you hear me better now? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> um, what Northampton's did their split tiered rates, they actually got a lot of pushback from the industrial side which you're going to get from your industry, which we only have one industry. So as you think about what are you, what are you really trying to do here? Are you trying to reward people who can serve water? Are you trying to reward people who um, use a lot? I don't know, that's conserving. Are you trying to, the real people who are the real residents, are you trying to give them a break? Are you just trying to uh, make sure there's, the transient population, you cover that cost of them being transient. Are those really what you're trying to do? Um, that's really probably the first thing you need to think about before you start talking about how to split the rates up. I mean, we're being, we're put, being pushed to have a per capita use in the water. Um, do we want to use that per capita use? People who use in their household or at their residents, whether it be a commercial residence or whether it be a single family home, if they use the water within that per capita use, they get a certain rate. But if they abuse that and they're above that, then they pay another rate. Um, those are kind of 
many of the things you really need to think about and what you truly are trying to reward and what you're trying to disincentivize by having a higher rate. Uh, Sean and then uh, Kathy and Dorothy in that order. Sean? Yeah, I would echo um, what Gilbert said. Um, I would also just say, keep in mind, um, again, these go, these month, the, the consumption drives the revenue, which ultimately goes into the enterprise fund. And a lot of the costs of the enterprise fund are, are fixed. Um, so, you know, depending on what model we use, if it, you know, we have to just consider if it's increasing revenues, decreasing revenues, and, and how that would impact the enterprise fund. Um, and we have seen, and, and Sonia um, and Gilford, I'm sure, have seen more than I have, um, the consumption at the colleges has actually gone down quite a bit over the last five to 10 years. Um, we're seeing significant drops in consumption there. So again, if, if we're looking at, you know, what Gilford was saying in terms of what are we trying to achieve, we are seeing reductions in consumption at the, at the college level. And of course, uh, the university put a lot of money into uh, water conservation on campus, uh, putting in new piping, new fixtures. Kathy, you had something else? Uh, yeah, I just, um, you know, I, I totally agree with Guilford on what are we trying to achieve. And I think um, one of the things I was struck was, and we, where Lynn said we're a different animal than Hadley in terms of, uh, uh, that's why in my little simple chart, I called it large users versus commercial and residential, <laughs> just on a, I'm assuming if we wanted to set up a different tier. We could do it by the cubic feet of water the whole entity used and it'd be some threshold so we wouldn't have to get narrowly by, that's one of my questions. We wouldn't say an apartment building with 10 is exempt, but an apartment building 20, it could be just how much total water is used or we could exempt apartments. So I think at least what I heard the consultants is we can set up categories and, um, and then the, the when I think about it, if, we're, if the advice we had was to do differential rates to encourage conservation, you know, so that if you use a lot more water, you'll go to a higher tier. So you can keep yourself on the lower tier. Um, and if we do that, then, and we get lower use, then we don't cover our fixed costs. So that's what was attractive to me about if we started to go that route, we should think about this quarterly charge where I think ours, Guilford, in one of the slides, I think we were $10 now would be the minimum we would pay. Um, I'd have to look at my own bill. Um, you know, we're very low users of water, so we don't come close to that annual fee that, you know, we're not on the sewer system either. So we're just, we're just town water. But but I think that that interaction between them and um, so you don't know if you go to higher use rate, if I water my lawn every day or take a thousand showers that I'll get hit with a higher rate versus I'm a low water user. Um, if I cut back, are we have a shortfall in our enterprise funds because uh, everybody's cutting back. Um, and so how do we cover? So I think they're interactive when we're thinking about what, if anything, do we want to do? Um, and I, the, the modeling in that is really tricky because you have to kind of start with static, assume all the water is being consumed, and then do something about suppose the water consumption went down by 3%, you know, what happens? Uh, so that's just been my thinking on what, if anything, do we want to do? What categories do we set up? Who do we exempt from something um, that it wasn't a jump right to, oh, let's take a look at this or that. It was probably something designed for Amherst with a lot of thought. Dorothy? Well, taking residences as an example, um, Keeping costs low and encouraging conservation is, I believe, more important in the long run than keeping enterprise funds uh, where they have been. Because we have to convert, conserve water, increasingly so, as we move into the future. I mean, everything I read says that. So we don't want a sudden loss or mess up with the enterprise fund. But I think 
I really do think a, a fixed fee and increased fees for usage or higher rates for higher usage in residences um, because it, that would encourage conservation and it would encourage people would, in order to keep their costs low, they would do it. So that would deal with length of showers. Um, it would do with watering lawns. Um, and also in New York City, they had a very successful program in stopping leaks. It turned out to have been lots of leaks every place. And if you don't have to pay for it, or if it's just leaking into your backyard, you don't go around getting it fixed necessarily. So I, I understand Kathy's position of not of wanting to keep the enterprise funds from going down, but I think they will. They're going to have to. We have to use less water and we have to work. I think the residences haven't really been, the screws haven't been put on. My husband is starting to talk to me about water conservation now. Um, I know I have work to do in being a, a better use of water. We're actually doing really well in water con use and consumption. We don't tend to use an, an awful lot. There are the houses that and the larger institutions that irrigate. Those people are probably the people who use the most water, but we are pretty good at keeping our water uses down. We've been having a building boom in town. I mean, if you walk around, there's new buildings just about everywhere. Um, those buildings aren't using the same amount of water as the older buildings, the same size. So we, we as a community are actually doing, to the detriment of the water enterprise, we're, they're doing much better at uh, conserving water and not, not wasting it. It's, um, it's quite interesting. Bernie? Yeah, just to reiterate, when Hadley put the system in place, we had lost one of our wells. So conservation, we're in the process of building a water treatment plant. So conservation was one of the goals. The other goal was to make sure that there was enough revenue being raised to make, to operate that, that water treatment plant. So um, again, folks are quite correct that how you, how you set the rates are going to make or break this in a lot of ways. I, uh, um, uh, you, you know, so, so choosing that, looking at Northampton is another example. Uh, the other thing is, like I said, Hadley's um, operations are a little bit more complicated than what it, what's displayed in the slides we got. So I'd encourage people to go to their website and look. For example, if you have a house residential unit and you're irrigating, your, you have a sprinkler system for your lawn, that requires a separate meter and that gets billed at a separate rate because the intention is to uh, drive down water you. Is that, is that in Hadley or is that not in Amherst? In Hadley. Okay. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure what yeah, we do with, that. with the second, uh, second meter. Uh, you, can also do, you can also have the metering system you have can also do leak detection. So that if you know, water usage starts to creep up at your house, the software will send you a, a note or give you a phone call and say, hey, we've noticed a spike in your water use. Your, your toilet may be leaking. The, the one thing uh, that we have to always remember is that with running enterprise funds, we're running our own businesses. And um, so if we have a goal that we're trying to conserve a lot, the question is, can we also then cut out some of our water system and cut out expenses to match it? Because if you... Uh, cut revenue and you don't cut expenses, uh, you got a problem. It's, it's a freestanding business. Um, would we ever be able to conserve enough um, to be able to shut down some part of our system? And Guilford is the one who probably can best address that question. I, I, we, uh, when I first got here in 2002, that was a big question UMass kept asking us and kept telling us, well, if we do this and conserve this much water, you're just gonna turn off this supply and you won't need that supply, so you'll save all this money. Um, but the regulatory side, which is another issue that comes in the water and sewer industry is you have to meet regulatory requirements. So if you have it and it's permitted and it can be used, it has to be, it has a fixed cost for maintaining that in a, in a ready to use situation. If you want to take the, chance to mothball it and put it into reserve, that's another category 
but to bring it out of reserve, that's another cost you have to add in. So as you, as you look at what you have for sources and what will be required in the future and balancing those sources, that's kind of the, as you talk about rates, that's kind of the other thing that goes into it. I mean, we're the regulatory people are asking us to take less surface water during the summer. So there's more water in the streams for the aquatic life and the fishies. Um, that means you have to take more from the wells and you have to balance it out. So you, we're, there's lots of things that will play into it that are regulatory and are, those are costs that are also have to be looked at as well. So there's fixed cost of the pipe, fixed cost of the plant and fixed costs of meeting regulations that make up that whole fixed cost. And then there's how much water you use. So I think that it's important to, and this is the follow up to that Guilford is the anxiety that the council members have had who have thought about this is if we go forward and complete the process of building a new centennial water treatment plant, we're making a long term commitment to using that water and to the expense of building the new centennial plant. And uh, then the, um, what's that going to do? to residential water rates, uh, what's Dorothy's uh, water bill gonna be uh, just on based upon her current water usage? Um, will it, how much will it go up? And is that something that we feel comfortable with? And, um, but then if uh, she goes into conservation because We've either structured it to encourage conservation or just the increased cost encourages conservation, um, then where does that put us economically? And I think those were the anxieties that this committee was sort of grappling with, which is why we're where we are in this conversation. I agree. And we don't have all the answers. It's you have to just kind of one thing in the water side to realize is it's harder and harder to get a, a, a clean water source approved and permitted. If you have them, they're like gold. Um, so you should keep them as long as you can and keep them in use as long as you can. Um, right. Because getting a new one, if we, if we decide we want to take something offline and totally mothball it, we may never be ever allowed to bring it back by the, regu the regulatory process. So you, you are you are, it's a balancing act and you have to figure out how to do it and make sure you're okay. Which is getting into guessing our future uses. So are. Uh, your hands are still up. Is that a new request? I, I just want to say my mantra, water is the most precious thing. And that a town without water is not a town and that um, I remember our discussions on Centennial and I feel very, very strongly that we should go forward because um, not to go forward could put us in a very bad place in the future that we can't even anticipate. That's all. So I think we need to uh, probably at our next meeting uh, try and pick up on this conversation because it's getting late tonight. Um, and try and decide whether we really want to go into an intensive analysis of water rates and what we want to look at. Um, but back to the initial question, what would be goals of doing that? Um, I think you probably need to start with some clarity. Kathy. Um, one suggestion, Andy, might be for the next meeting, um, you know, if there are a couple people who want to work on this interactively with Guilford, um, with that, what are our goals and what two or three things might we want to look at, bring it back to the full committee to say, are we interested in actually asking for this analysis before we ask staff to do a lot of work? And I don't think we have to think of this goes in place next January. We can think this might be one year from now, two years from now. It's the time horizon doesn't matter. It's just the 
getting some information on what might happen if we did the following with these goals in mind. So it might be good to, I threw this together just to stimulate people's thinking and then Bernie jumped in saying, I've done this in at least one other town and Guilford knows a lot about. So I don't know whether we might want to next time say, do we want to go as far as saying a couple people, a subcommittee, sit down with Guilford, come back with, and it might be another person from the council and not just from finance, um, come back with, here are three things or four ways we might want to look at this, um, or do we want to just stop um, because it's too much to bite off right now? Lynn, I, I, I want to encourage that weighing of, is this the time to do this? I don't think we want to do that today, but I really think that needs to be the question. One of the key questions on our agenda is, is this the time to do this? Right. And or, are there other areas where we need additional assistance that would take up the same people in the same energy? And I, I, I just want to say that you know, we just saw the whole trade-off where the council said, go with the master plan. And then last night we voted and said, stop. So I don't want to be in a situation like that again. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Lynn. And I don't think using any staff resources, if we don't want to get into this now, um, and certainly if this isn't the right time to do it, do you want to say over the next two years, we should look at it or do we just want to say leave our simple to understand system in place because we've got bigger issues that pull the same people i think it's a very good question yeah the easiest uh, approach to take right now is to just say that for the fy 22 water rates which we would establish in june of uh, next year to take effect on July 1st, which is next round of water rate structuring, that we don't make any changes um, and uh, but that we continue this discussion so that we just build in a lot of time to think it through for the year after. Totally agree. Set a recommendation that we want to just report back to the council that um, this is what we've concluded and uh, uh, if there are any council comments then we can get at the time we present our next committee report. Um, and one question. Centennial, we voted on that. That is going forward. We don't have to make any decisions on that now. Is that correct? We took step one. Uh, Guilford can tell us on timing, but step one was we we're going forward with the design of Okay. the new facility and we had the request in there that um, they look at one aspect of it but that process is underway and then they would come back to us um, when it's time to actually issue bonds for construction and that's when the big decision is okay thank you uh, you've already issued us permission for bonding already so there's we'd only would have to come back if we have a project which is more than what was authorized in that bonding, which is 11, 11 million. Yeah, that was one of the orders for, that was part of the, the budget process. Remind me. And I think the council may want to take a look at the connection fee piece, maybe uh, implement something along that line and hold off on the rate, because rate, the, setting the rates is a complicated task and it's something you're likely to have to bring in a consultant to do. Um, I, I don't have any doubt about the capabilities of Amherst staff, but it's a complicated matter and there's all kinds of software that you can use to do this stuff. So, um, you know, it's, with, with the new water treatment plan coming online, you may want to be gradually, slowly building up a revenue source. Um, not so much that you're going to really pinch people, but doing that in a, in a more gentle way uh, to help uh, pay the cost of that plant. Reed, are you suggesting that we look at a connection fee as a possibility for as early as uh, 
FY22? That, I mean, that could be, but that, I think that's going to depend on the, what, what sense of urgency there is around funding for the, uh, uh, for the water system. And uh, again, a, you know, a small increase in the, in the connection fee wouldn't, uh, would not have, I, I don't think it would have the impact that um, jumping the rates. Yeah, uh, Andy, we should make sure Bernie gets the chart that we had in May, June that shows where our water rates are going as the new plant comes online. You know, we had we added out five or six years, Bernie. It's a fifty percent increase in the no. rate. Yes, yeah, we, just, yeah, we did, did a jump up, but the but the projection given purely on covering costs. So, mm -hmm. we, but that would be a good thing for you to have. It's it was part of one of our packets. Yeah, that's information that I don't have. Thank you. Okay. So we'll get that. Done. So I don't think that we have anything else that we need to deal with on the water question right now. Um, I'll get that to Bernie and uh, I think that we've come to a conclusion unless somebody wants to actually make an motion, but I think I can report it as a sense of the committee. Yeah, I, th I thought you worded it well, Andy. I typed it more or less, but yes. So we'll just uh, report that if, if there's no objection. Lynn had her hand raised. Lynn? No, it's actually for the next item. Okay. Uh, yeah, I want to um, try and go through to what, where we are and get on to the last items because what we wanted to do actually uh, was looking at the uh, process ahead, which was. I had labeled as review of the FY21 budget process, but I think we all know what it's about. I think I had described it earlier in this meeting is when I, we were talking to Darcy about the FY22 process. So, so then the question of what other finance committee goals do we have for the year that would uh, plug into our timeline that we work forward to in the process. Lynn? The major capital projects. Yep, that's the obvious one. And uh, Bob, you can need to unmute that. Yeah, I, I think we ought to build into our schedule a review process of where we are in the FY21 budget, given all the uncertainties, um, which is maybe more than what we would normally do. Um, just because, I, you know, we might have to do some things in mid, you know, midstream. So. Uh, Sean or Sonny might speak to that um, because I think that what we what we were afraid of originally was that there would be a large um, problem that might come along because the state would fund less than we anticipated, which is, did not happen. Uh, and as far as monitoring revenue and uh, expenses as they go through is an ongoing process and reported quarterly as it is. Yeah, I mean, similar to, you know, like with state aid, um, you know, as things happen and we become aware of them, um, you know, we can report that at these meetings or give an update, you know, briefly at these meetings as thing, you know, like for example, the enterprise funds and, and you know, tracking water consumption, sewer consumption, how that impacts the revenues. Um, we can give those updates at these meetings if that would help, um, you know, just keep people in the loop on that stuff. John. Yeah. I just also want to bring up that we uh, we get we do quarterly um, reports. Yeah, and you'll um, see in the first and second quarters what our revenue is doing and stuff. So we're right on top of that, and we get that to the committee in the quarters. So any anything else? Because I think I, I appreciate Bob's suggestion. I think that it's built into our process, though, uh, Sean. Oh, just it was another goal. Um, I know we talked about this and we may have to figure out what the right uh, 
order of events is, but um, I am looking at our financial policies that are on the, that the town has and trying to update those. Um, I think the last time they were updated, it was maybe eight years ago um, or five, five years ago. And some of them just need to be updated because we changed our form of government. Um, and some of them, uh, I think we just want to update because times have changed a little bit. Um, and so that's something I'm working on that I would want to get maybe feedback from the finance committee on. You just uh, talked with uh, Paul about the process that he envisions. Yeah, I mean, last I knew we were thinking that ultimately it's a Paul, um, it's sort of a, a management decision about the policies themselves um, and that we would get feedback from the finance committee on those, but I think we still have to double check that and now that we're under the new form of government. Because I think in the past, the select board was the one that adopted um, the financial policies. No, actually that's not true. Is it the finance committee? Uh, the finance committee did and uh, they were adopted by the finance committee, uh, which was a committee of the legislative body. Okay, and so we can, so we'll, we'll find out the answer to that and see if it's the councilor um, or Paul, but either yeah. way, that's something the project we're working on that we would want finance committees input on. Yeah, I think that I was hoping that uh, Lynn uh, and Paul would have that discussion include me to the extent if they thought it was appropriate because I was on the uh, finance committee that adopted the current policies from the beginning. Um, have and many of them are still very good. Not, we're, not, um, we're, not reinventing, we're not reinventing the wheel when it comes to policy. Some of it's just um, updating them for the new form of government. Let me, that's because we used the finance director, who was then John Musanti, and he did most of the writing for yeah. us. Let me set up a meeting that Sean and um, Sonia and Paul and you and I would be at. Okay. So, anything else? So what I was thinking is that um, we had been trying to meet on the day after each council meeting, but uh, for various reasons, uh, probably do not need to meet and should not meet on September 15th, which is the day after the next council meeting. But um, I was wondering if people could uh, let, let me know if September 22nd is an acceptable date. And um, the second piece to that is whether you want to look at changing our practice of meeting on generally on Tuesdays following council meetings. Do you want answers now, Andy, or just we should all email you? Um, why don't you email me on those two questions and I'll try and do a follow up on uh, just to remind you. So the, but the two questions are, do you still want to um, generally say that we're reserving the Tuesdays after council meetings uh, at this time in the afternoon and that we meet if we need to? And uh, the second is uh, skipping the next council meeting. Would you be available um, for the date that follows two council meetings out September 22nd? Okay, the only question I would have then is the council then meets on the 28th. So yep. if we meet on the 20th, we don't, that's gone and then? That's uh, yeah. the second, that's the break fast of Yom Kippur. Okay, so that's gone. Okay, so I just need to fix my calendar. Right, I, I'll be getting an email out to you. The two dates we have definitely secured in September are the 14th and the 21st. Okay. And, um, the only thing that we are trying to look at is whether or not we're going to schedule a um, public forum and maybe a joint and maybe at the same time a hearing on the master plan. But we haven't made that decision yet. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, so instead of the Tuesday following the town council, could it be the next Tuesday? So one week you have town council, the next week you have finance, or just to kind of spread it out? Yeah, let me uh, just uh, tell you why we ended up there and then, but um, make that part of your comments that you offer when you respond. 
the reason that we had done it that way is uh, people who are planning travels um, that they are like taking a trip. Most of the council members um, are present um, in town for council meetings. We hopefully will not be meeting by Zoom for the rest of our lives. So mm -hmm. it's beginning to feel like we probably will. Uh, in that way, we were getting, we were catching people while they were in town. But actually, because of Zoom, uh, which could be lasting for another year, for all we know, mm -hmm. it might be something to consider. Um, it's actually a good point you raise. The only advantage. Excuse me, I had my hand raised. Yeah. I really would like to see it on the uh, an opposite day from the town council meeting, particularly when we have the kind of meetings that we had last night, um, which seem to be a leitmotif of this group. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I know I would be have been in a better place at this meeting today if I hadn't been up as late and uh, slept as little. And I think it's consistent and that's not going to change. So I think we need to be more honest. And with Zoom, you can be anywhere. Yeah, and we're not going anywhere. Uh, Kathy. Um, I don't disagree with you, Pat. The only issue has been that, that we have more time if we have to write a report between meetings if we meet the day after. But as long as we can be uh, efficient in whatever, right, there's no reason not to do it on alternate weeks. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we who write the reports do uh, benefit from that extra week when uh, we got placed in the position in that last finance committee report of turning it out so quickly, it was uh, murder. But we survived, barely. So, Anything else that people need? We have no public, so we do not need to do public comment. We can look at that. Kathy. I just had one question on, you know, scheduling future things. Sean, at one point you said you were looking at uh, parking fees and rates or uh, fee permit fees and things. Um, I don't know whether that not on the uh, policy wise side, but on the finance side of it, if there would be a point where you would want to come and give a preview of what you're thinking of changing um, or the ways you're thinking of changing or whether you want it, any thoughts from people. So it's, it's, I don't know what that schedule is like. You just mentioned it, I think sometime in the late spring that that was one of the things you were going to focus on. Yeah, yeah, we're actually gathering all the data right now. Um, kind of compiling a couple of comparison districts or comparison municipalities. Um, so yeah, I can, you know, I can talk to Andy about maybe where that makes sense to fit into the finance committee schedule for the year. Okay. I assume that it's also um, a TSO committee question and uh, we don't want to get caught into two committees going in opposite directions, but we do have to worry about um, the effect of any proposed change on the enterprise fund. And, uh, I'm worried about that enterprise fund anyway, and I'm hoping that you guys keep us up to date on what's going on because of the uh, bus service and whether our revenue projections from what we're going to be receiving from the five colleges and the university will change uh, as a result of reduced ridership and whether the, if the bus service is the same and the ridership is in contribution from them goes down, those kinds of issues we need to understand because of the effect on the enterprise fund. So anything else? Seeing nothing, uh, then um, I'm going to say that uh, the committee is adjourned, and I appreciate it. It's been a long meeting, but I think a productive one. Uh, did you have anything else, Len? No. Oh, okay, so. Waving goodbye. <laughs> waving goodbye. Thank you yes, all. Thank you, and uh, we're adjourned at three minutes after five.